Hello everyone, my name is Shannon Ozerny. I am the Head of Youth Services at the West Vancouver Memorial Library and it is my great pleasure to be your host for this special event with Polly Horvath. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the library has its home on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, and in particular recognize the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. We are so grateful to be here as guests on this land to live and learn together. A little bit about our format today. Very shortly, I will be welcoming Polly on screen. I'll have some questions for her, including some lightning round questions. And then we will be taking questions from you. So as Polly and I are talking, please feel free to enter your questions into the chat. We have the magnificent Lisa monitoring that for us, and she'll be collecting questions as we go along. So as they pop into your mind, please enter them in. I'm excited and I hope you are excited too. So now it is my very great pleasure to introduce you to Polly Horvath. When I think of Polly's books, I think of words like cozy, timeless, classic, mischievous, uh, whip smart, and ageless. You could truly read one of her books out loud to a room with a seven-year-old and a 97-year-old and both would be absolutely tickled. And more than that, her work is full of the most interesting, evocative, and wacky language. Um, I've learned some of my favorite phrases from Polly's books, including buttering your parsnips. Polly has checked off so many of the boxes any writer could hope to check off. She's won a National Book Award, a Newbery Honor, she's been an Oprah pick, a New York Times bestseller, and so much more. And her brand new book, which I have here, Pine Island Home, is Little Women meets Penderwicks meets Home Alone with a Pacific Northwest twist. We are going to be talking all about it. Polly, this is your official cue to unmute, and it is so great to have you here. Thank you. Yay! <laughs> It's all it's all working beautifully. I should start by saying that today is a provincial professional development day. So that means no children are in school and I think there are some kids watching who aren't in school. So I was wondering when you were a kid and you weren't in school, what could we have found you doing? I spent a lot of time on our roof with my little notebook writing poetry. Um, I or in trees. I think kids like to be up high and it's a, sort of a good metaphor for writing because you're you've got a view over everything but nobody can really see you and um, it's a good place to think and so I would spend a lot of time up there doing that. I did a lot of things alone. I think a lot of writers are introverts by nature and um, I, I would play endlessly when I was a little girl with the cans and in the bottles in our cupboards in our kitchen cupboards. I'd sit up on the kitchen counter, um, and it was wonderful practice for writing because with the cans and the bottles, you can have you know a, a bottle of mustard is for <laughs> one day and part of a building the next day, and somebody eats your characters one night and you have to make up new characters. And so I would sit up there endlessly playing with the the uh, the things in the cupboard and then as soon as I could put pen to paper I spent a lot of time writing after that I was sort of doing the same things then that I'm doing now I was gonna say that sounds very on brand I feel like even now we could find you with some mustard and some hot sauce on the floor <laughs> <laughs> muttering to yourself on a day off I played with dolls till I was paper dolls particularly till I was about 14 I mean it was it I did not, you know, I was, I probably regressed quite a bit, but I could still take paper dolls quite happily and sit around and have the characters talking to each other. And uh, that for me is a lot of the fun with writing too, is when you're 
uh, have the characters talking to each other and you get to be in, do both voices. And, uh, you know, you said, be very careful. You don't let that drift into your regular relationships. <laughs> Well, it's that notion of play, too, and we always think that play is this linear thing that has to end once we, we reach a certain age or we need to lose interest in it when we reach a certain age, but writing does seem a lot like playing. Well, I think it is it, at in its best form, it's a lot of play. Um, any of the arts, I think, in their best form is play because um, I think that's where you really... Uh, uh, your mind kind of gets a chance to bip about without too many rules and regulations. I, one of the things I think you recognize when you're writing is that there aren't really any rules, that rules are something that are only things that have been made up by other people and their idea of the way to go about things is no more important than yours. And uh, so with play, you sort of abandon the rules and, and do things the way you want. And then later when you're reshaping a book, then you can sort of think a little bit more about, you know, whether it's going to be in a format that anybody's going to understand and, and, and rules maybe come in a bit there. But um, for me, the most, uh, the fun part is, uh, for instance, when we did the bunnies, when um, the bunny books, what was really fun was my husband and I would go on walks and our kids, had, we'd empty nested and we started to create these characters of Mr. and Mrs. Bunny and and it just became this running joke between the two of us. And I later transferred it all into a book, but it was just a kind of a form of play, something to do when we were taking these long walks. And uh, I think a lot of book ideas come out of that kind of free form play. Well, I want to come back to um, not writing rule questions, but writing wisdom questions. But first, I have some questions about Pine Island Home, which I love. You can tell just the way I keep holding it up. It's like a, <laughs> a child who found some like interesting creature on the seashore. Like, look at this. Um, I adored this book. Can you tell um, our viewers a little bit about it? Yeah, Pine Island Home is, well, for one thing, it's, it's a very different book from the kinds I've done before. This is much more of a traditional book with a traditional arc and traditional characters. It's the story of the four McCready sisters and their parents are there living in Borneo and their parents are swept away in a tsunami and they're left orphaned and they're uh, terrified that they're going to be put into foster care if somebody doesn't take all four of them in and they find um, an aunt on finally in British Columbia on an island not unlike Vancouver Island where I live to take them and so they fly to Vancouver or Pine Island and when they get there, they discover that while they were in flight, the aunt has uh, died suddenly, but that nobody really knows they're coming. So they've inherited this old farm, and uh, they realize that if anybody finds out they don't have a guardian, that they're most likely, because there's four of them, they'll be split into separate foster homes, and they're, they can't stand the thought of that so they decide not to tell anybody and the story is about how they keep the secret and how they fend for themselves and the people that come on board to care for them eventually now i i use the little women comparison in my introduction just i think because there's four sisters but honestly i this book is much better written and much more pragmatic. <laughs> I am actually, I'm not the biggest Little Women fan. Um, how do you feel about that comparison? Is that irksome or will you take it? No, I, I really, um, I'm honored by that comparison. I've heard it um, several times and again, probably because there are four sisters, but also because I think that uh, it's a nicer book than I usually do. The characters are nicer people. Um, I tend to write rather edgy uh, books sometimes, and in this one, I think when the book was writing itself, um, it was the characters just were so nice to each other. I was amazed. I mean, so usually when you're sitting there, you're just typing away, and you're sort of watching from some part of your brain, the other part creating it. So I was sitting there watching it, just amazed at the nice things everybody was saying to each other. And so in that sense, it's a very soft, cozy book. And I wrote it, of course, uh, about a year and a half before COVID. So I wasn't planning on writing a cozy, soft book that would be nice to read during difficult times. But I think that it 
in terms of when it came out. It was kind of, it's just a nice curl up on the couch in bad weather read, I think. And I'm kind of pleased to have written a book like that because I don't think I've written one before. Well, it's interesting you say that. Sometimes when I'm telling kids about your books or book talking them, I say, you're like the female role doll or I say like you were Lemony Snicket before there was Lemony Snicket it's it's that same kind of uh the humor has a little bit of a bite that leaves a bit of a mark sometimes and the the adults aren't really too worried about the health and welfare of children mostly no that's (laughs) true and you know I've been asked about that a number of times and also why the parents are always dead and I always used to think that Killing off the parents was something that so many kids book writers did and that I did quite a bit because it allows the children to have a firsthand experience of the world without the sort of buffer of an adult. And But lately I've come to realize when thinking about it that I do it because it's really how I grew up. I had parents that were wonderful people, but they both grew up without parents really. And they sort of were very in the background parents. And I think we always, it was like being raised by wolves a bit. We always had to fend for ourselves. And I think because of that, um, it was just a natural situation to put kids into the same kind of uh, thing that I was familiar with when I was writing about it. So I was writing about what I knew essentially. Um, And so I, I think probably that has more to do with the parentless state of these kids than anything else. And I mean, if you, if, when I was a kid, I wasn't really thinking about where my mom was and what her mom, my mom was doing. It's childhood is like a very, was for me anyway, a very narcissistic experience. So I didn't really, wasn't particularly interested in reading books about, you know, what was going on with mom and dad anyway. Well, yeah. And when I was growing up, our favorite game was a game we called Lost Girls, where um, we would all, I, I ran with this little gang of girls with my sister and, and these other girls. And um, the game always began, let's pretend our parents are dead. I mean, <laughs> that was the opening line every day to the game. And But the, I, I think that that is really wonderful for kids. They have this amazing sense of adventure. And I grew up in a time uh, very differently where we were just thrown out of the house basically in the summer at, you know, at, right after breakfast and you weren't expected to come home until dinner time. And uh, it was great. It was just wonderful to have this entirely parentless, um, adventurous life. And um, the, I think you're right when you say that this is your your nicest book. It's definitely not saccharine, though. It's not that that is one one. Not that this is a little women bashing session, but one thing about little women, it's like, oh, goodness gracious, like, Ma, let's take our dinner to the neighbors. It's like, can't you leave a little bit, you know, leave a few buns for yourself for a cold cut sandwich after. Um, But uh, this book is very genuine. And I think one of the things I really connected with, Fiona, the oldest sister, is a real warrior. And she has a lot to worry about. She has finances. She has the welfare of her sisters. She has to be thinking about taxes. Um, But it was like reading about a character that worries without getting stressed out myself as a reader. So I'm not sure how you did that. But my question is how you balanced what is really kind of the tough realism of their situation and and the humor? Um, oh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I think with, um, I think a lot of the humor comes uh, from nervousness. I, uh, the more nervous I've been in my life, the funnier the books have been. Uh, and I think that um, it, when the humor does come out, that's, that's why, because humor comes from this kind of a, a high, twitchy energy. Um, I think sort of think Woody Allen. And um, I think that in that kind of a situation, and that, that kind of situation that the girls find them in, it, it, everybody thinks that when you become an adult, all these things, taxes and mortgages and everything, um, as a kid, you don't think how difficult that is for your parents to negotiate. And it's something that you figure when you grow up, it's just going to be come second nature. And I still find all of that incredibly scary. <laughs> um, and so I, it was easy to imagine Fiona in that position. Um, and I, oh, I did want to add that, uh, did you realize that Louise May Alcott, when she talked about writing Little Women in those books said, 
Um, I, I don't really like writing all this moral pap. I have to write it because it sells. Okay, well, she's, so she knew, too. Yeah. <laughs> we can't blame her. She was in on it. Um, and the other thing about the book, too, which I, especially now with it being sort of more progressively awful outside in terms of climate, um, that the setting is such a calming and grounding force for the sisters, especially um, Natasha. And I'm wondering what kind of relationship you have with where you live or how that impacts your writing or creative process. Well, I, I'm living here on Vancouver Island in a very rural area, and I, I just feel so lucky to be here. It's, uh, it's, I grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, a very sort of little white picket fence suburban area, and I never felt at home there. I never liked it. Um, and then I lived in cities after that. I lived in New York City and Montreal and Toronto, and I, I managed okay in those places, but I didn't fall in love with them. And when we moved to Vancouver Island, suddenly I was living someplace where I, there are bears in the yard and cougars. And I go off every morning with our dog on these cliff walks um, for hours at a time along the ocean. And, you know, you can walk for hours and not see a soul. And just the beauty of that is what I, I gave that to Natasha. Natasha, I, I got to write through it by writing through Natasha, who loves it. And all the, the girls, what I liked and what I tried to keep in the book is that all the girls love different things. Different things are important to them. And so I was able to, uh, and I wanted to balance that. I wanted to make sure that there was uh, enough of that in the book, because I think when things are grim all the time, you kind of stop listening. Um, it, it's just, you know, you don't, you don't want to go on with it. But when you can balance it with, with them loving things. And I think that that's realistic as well. It's, I don't think we ever go through a period when everything is gray and dark. Their situation is pretty horrible. They don't have somebody to take care of them. Fiona's terrified that they're gonna be found out and split up. But at the same time, there's these other elements that come in, the beauty of the farm, the, uh, the beauty of their surroundings and the animals and and what they all discover about themselves and the kindness of strangers not to become clenched of what suddenly but <laughs> i i just found that um i that kind of a balance was a it was nice for me too because you're going through whatever your characters are going through when you're writing a book you're li you're with that book generally 24 hours a day you don't really get a whole lot of break from it, and you're within the mood of the book. So, one that a book that's I don't know somebody who's written write something terribly grim is is I would think it's a very difficult thing to do for very long, and so for me, I got this this little respite of of you know being able to write about nature or or and and to give that aspect of things to Natasha, uh, and. Marlon, of course, her love of cooking and baking. That was a wonderful little place to escape to, too, with her her brilliant cakes. And and so it, that that was kind of fun for me to bop around to the different things and write about things. Writing about things you love is always a nice thing to do. And I, I mean, I loved all of the cooking stuff with Marlon. And also little Charlie, the youngest sister, she she really loves people and she thrives off that human connection and she's um, almost being deprived of that because Fiona the eldest is saying listen you can't be bringing friends around here we're going to get found out there's just there's so much that's so relatable right now oh thanks yeah I like Charlie too um, I mean the really nice thing for me is that I actually like so many of these characters and you don't always like your characters um, I, I did I and uh I'm, I'm working on the sequel right now, and it's really fun because it was Fiona's, really Fiona's narration, or, or it wasn't her na narration, it was uh, mine, but it was um, the omniscient narrator, but it was really Fiona's book primarily, and the second one is more of, of Marlon's book, so there, I get to do more of, with the cooking and more with the things from her point of view, and, and it's, it's a little darker, the second one, but yeah. Will there be four? maybe i don't really know you know the, originally the book was titled martha's boat and i liked that title because i felt that um what it was what the book was really about is about 
the people in your life and how they keep you afloat. And um, she, Martha talks about how the, her boat, her fishing boat is her, her purpose and, and uh, her family and she doesn't need another one. And then at the end, of course, Fiona says uh, that to Al that uh, they, they, the four children become his boat. And so I like the title Martha's Boat and the German publisher liked it too and kept it. But I had trouble with the Americans and the Canadians who did not like that. Uh, title because they wanted they said if you call it Martha's boat we're gonna have to put a boat on the cover and there's <laughs> really a boat in the story there it was very literal so I went with Pine Island Home not liking the title but now I do because if it's a series then I can have Pine Island Christmas and Pine Island uh, Library and Pine Island you know and uh, do a number of those but I shouldn't say that because whenever you tell someone you're going to write something like a series you inevitably end up not um doing it um you can't really I, the only enduring writing rule i have to have is that you have to sit down and write the book that shows up and the book that shows up is not always the book that you want to be writing i know when i wrote the canning season i had had this wonderful idea of this uh, i loved edward eager as a kid reading his books he wrote these seven perfect magical books um, half magic and uh, magic by the lake and and I reread them over and over again and then he died so I decided I was going to write a seventh one and so I sat down to write this um, wonderful or an eighth one to write this wonderful Edward Egeris book and I would fall asleep on my computer every single day uh, when I sat down to write and I began to think I had narcolepsy <laughs> and uh, but it turned out that it just was not the book I so I decided to scrap that book completely and just let it rip and write whatever came to mind and I ended up being something completely different much darker um, not this gentle children's book uh, but it it something real was driving the book and I was able to sit down and write the book that was there and not the book that I wanted to do. So although I say I'm going to do a series, who knows? <laughs> Fair enough. We won't hold you to it. And that's actually a nice little transition because I do have some sort of broader based writing questions for students we might have watching who want to be writers or um, people of all ages who want to be writers. So I'm not going to spoil anything, but a couple of characters in the book have a rocky relationship with publishing. <laughs> and one thing that comes up over and over again is how difficult it is to actually get a book published. And I was wondering what your journey to publication was like and, and how you ended up a published author. Well, I will tell you, Shannon, it was long <laughs> let's get it out let's do it we're on youtube live let's let's work the problem <laughs> all right well, i started writing when i was eight and i had a mother who was a writer so i i knew about the business end of writing i knew that you know you didn't give it away you got paid for it and so i started uh, when I was eight, when I wrote my first story, I insisted that she, she type it up and we were going to send it out, which we didn't do. But by the time <laughs> I was 14, I'd actually written a complete book. And so I, I did, I started sending it out and I blitzed the publishers. Um, and I kept getting rejection slips, but some of them were very kind and very confused because, um, they were writing to Mrs. They write to me as Mrs. Horvath because I never told them how old I was. And they wanted to edit me, and I kept saying, no, no, don't touch my golden prose, which is very confusing for these editors. And um, one of them became my agent, and so all through my teen years, I would send things out. Now, I had a wonderful English teacher and a really wonderful German teacher, and they knew I wanted to be a writer when I was in high school, so... They set up a little cubicle for me in our school library and they gave me posters to put on the window so nobody could see into this office. They gave me a typewriter and a coffee pot and a pass key to the building and they set up my course's independent study. And they said, um, we'd be happy if you wanted to come in every day and write and you can do your course's independent study. So I did that for the last two years of high school. I wrote uh, obsessively every day. I had cartons of manuscripts didn't get anything published um so and then my agent left to become something i think a psychologist or something um which i always felt like sort of driven her to and so then i knew i needed a day job so i was also dancing at the time so i went to canadian college of dance in toronto and i studied to be a dance teacher 
And I thought that would make a wonderful day job. So then I started to uh, write and teach and write and teach and write and teach. And dance. And dance. <laughs> and, um, I was living in a crummy apartment in Montreal. And I was sending out this book, An Occasional Cow. And I was getting rejection slips from all the major publishers. Again, well, I had a really awful kitchen where the wallpaper was peeling and I couldn't afford to do anything about it. So what I did was every time my rejection slip came in, it made me feel obscurely better to take the rejection slip and plaster some bit of the wall because I thought, okay, when one came in, I'd go, okay, that's great. That will sit right there over this. So by the time I got an encouraging note from a publisher, um, I had an entire wall plastered in rejection slips. And by that point, I was 23. And um, I got a letter, a little postcard from Mary Cash at Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, and she was an editor there, and she said, um, I don't want this book, do you have anything else? And so I sent them something else that I had, and that was the only kind of encouragement I'd ever had. I was very excited, and she wrote back and said, well, I don't want this one either. So then I took the original one and I, and I sent it to another editor there and, and, he, and that was Risa Arnold and she said, well, I really like it, but would you be willing to let me edit it on spec? So she's edited it with me for seven years and I cannot believe we did this. Nobody in publishing. Seven years? Yes, nobody would do this. <laughs> seven years working on that book. And I wouldn't do it anymore, but at the time, um, that was the only one I had. And we spent seven years. When I turned 30, she, it was finally accepted by Farrah Strauss and Drew for publication. And then I felt very happy because it immediately got a New York Times book uh, review and was doing really well. And after that, it was somewhat easier. But it was, you know, that's from eight until 30. I So one of my tips for writers is you really have to if you believe in your own book you really have to persevere because it is very hard to break in and i hear i don't know but i hear that it's even harder now than it used to be i mean before you used to be able to send things out yourself now it's very hard to get read except unless you have an agent and it's very hard to get an agent so you have but you have to forget all of that and just knock on doors and um that's basically that's basically my story well, one thing I was wondering specifically about you and your work, um, in one of the reviews of Pine Island Home, Kirkus, who's notoriously grumpy, but really quite liked this book of yours, uh, and gave it a starred review, Kirkus said, Horvath doesn't stint on vocabulary or on sophisticated observations. And I'm wondering if you ever have to fight for a particular word or phrase that maybe an editor says, oh, kids aren't going to know that, or oh, they won't know what that means. Um... Yes, it depends on the editor. I had one publishing house um, where I had an editor who often didn't know the words. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which I found very frightening. Um, and then, and really didn't, I, I have had that problem. I've never had that problem with my current editor. Um, occasionally you get people who want to dumb things down for children and it it's really upset I find that really upsetting because I know that when I was a kid you we were encouraged to read everything so you know by the time I was in grade six I was bombing through Dickens and with a dictionary <laughs> next to me and it was wonderful because and David Mitchell uh, the uh, British comedian has got who does these soapbox rants has a wonderful rant because he used to work for British television and have exactly the same problem. And his response to it was, look, kids are curious. They are naturally curious. And if you dumb everything down to what they already know, they give them nothing to be curious about. You want, you know, you want them to want to look up these words. And also Words are, writing is communication, and the more words you know, the better you can communicate precisely what you want to say. You want to be able to tell people exactly what you want to say. Whole languages are disappearing, and with the, the disappearance of a language, you have the dis, disappearance of a whole way of looking at the world and being able to communicate that way of looking at it, and that's what writers do. They give you a different way of looking at the world, somebody else's view. And it's the only way we can truly get into each other's heads. And it, to me, that just is fascinating. It opens up all kinds of possibilities. It's a wonderful thing. And 
which is why children should be encouraged to, to know as many words as possible and to keep looking them up because there's such subtle differences in the way of saying things. And you want to get exactly precisely the word. I love the, the a thesaurus because you can type in a word and you can get all these nuances and different ways of saying the same thing. And you're, you're always trying to get closer and closer to exactly what it is that you want to say. And I use dictionaries and thesauruses constantly. And it's really nice to have them on the computer now because you can just look around from your magazine or from your manuscript to your um, uh, dictionary and, and take a look. Um, but I still try to learn a new word every day. I mean, I just think words are fascinating. Uh, and, and we should encourage, to, and, and wonderful and joyful. And we should encourage children to, to enjoy them and, and love them. And you, you don't want to give children only what they already know. What in world fun is that? You know, so I, I'm quite passionate about that subject, Shannon. <laughs> And I should say your books definitely aren't overly ornamental or flowery or anything like that. It's just, it it often adds so much to the characterization of these people. And even just someone like Al Farber in the book, who's their kind of crotchety neighbor, he just answers the door every time going, what? And just whenever you see that word, what, in all caps, you think, oh, there's Al. Uh, so it doesn't even necessarily need to be a word or phrase that's, you know, brand new to us. It's just the way that people talk and express themselves in your books is just part of what makes a Polly Horvath book, I think. Oh, well, thank you. I like Robertson Davies and his idea of the plain style myself. Although, I, I, you know, I'm reading, I'm rereading all of his books right now. So I'm sort of, it's in my head, but um yeah, I I think you can have use vote, uh, a lot of different words and interesting words, but use them in a way that that's you know as you say not flowery but plain and and simple. Yeah. I'm just going to remind anyone who's watching, if you have a question, you can enter it in the chat and Lisa will make sure that we ask it. But I have several others in our last 10 minutes or so together. Um, I was wondering, Polly, you've, you've been writing a while, you've won a bunch of awards, you've received all these positive reviews, and I'm wondering if how you measure success as a writer, how, how do you do that now? And is it a metric that's kind of changed for you over time? Do you, do, have you changed how you think about what makes success as a writer? Well, yeah, I mean, I was an extremely ambitious eight-year-old, and, and because of my mother, I knew about the Newbery and all the different prizes out there, and I, you know, I wanted to immediately win all the awards and all the prizes, so I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, and, you know, not a nothing zilch, um, and I became disillusioned and disenchanted and very, very bitter, and then I turned nine. <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, I think that now, when I sort of looking back on, I, and I still, you know, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say I, I love getting a good review, I like getting the stars, I like winning awards, all of those things are, are lovely. They're like, I had a jazz teacher once, he used to say, everybody likes a little pizzazz. And so, I mean, a little pizzazz is really nice, but I will tell you, I have two moments from my writing career that really stand out to me. And one, both of them happened when I was on book tours. One, I was in Flagstaff, Arizona, and I was sitting in the library talking to a bunch of moms and their daughters, because that's generally who the audience was for everything on a waffle, and that was the book I was on tour for. And so I was used to going around the country and talking about that. And But in this library, there was all these moms and daughters, and then there was this one guy sitting right in the middle. And he wasn't my usual audience. He was sort of dressed in oily work clothes and oily work boots and, and a coverall. And he was sitting there with some book and he was scrolling and scrolling it the whole time. And he was just beaming love at me through the whole talk. And I kept looking, where's your kid? Where's your kid? And I couldn't, he wasn't with anybody apparently. And he came up afterwards to the book signing and he wanted me to sign, he had a copy of, um, of An Occasional Cow, my first book, and he wanted me to sign it. Now, An Occasional Cow is a book about this little girl who visits her cousins in Iowa, and they play with pigs and stuff, and it's it's a, it's a romp, really. It's it's very silly, and there's no real there there. It was, just, it was the first book I had published, and it was just meant to be funny and silly. And But this, he said to me, 
he said, I, I just want you to know how much this book has meant to me in all for my life. He said, I have, I, this book has gotten me through all the hard times in my life. And I wanted to thank you. And I thought, there's nothing in this book. But I understood it because I know that I have books like that. I have books that um, other people would think are, are, are silly, but they're, they're the books I reread when times are hard. And they're kind of like your pit crew, those books. And this book had done that for him. And I was so elated to have been able to do that for somebody else. And you, you, that's why I always think, sometimes you sit down and you think, why am I bothering to do this? This book is terrible. Because you often feel that way mid writing a book. And you think, what, you know, I don't need to write anymore. Why bother? But then you, you remember you do bother because somebody else bothered to write you know, this book that has, that got you through your t- times or bothered to make this movie that you, you rewatch because it moves you in a particular way. So my advice to everyone is, is, you know, take the trouble, bother to do it because you don't know what is going to affect who and, and how important it's going to be for them. And what may seem, feel to you is a silly effort on your part, may be incredibly valuable to somebody else. And the other one that really touched me was I was on tour in Atlanta and this woman came in to my reading and she said look I haven't read your books but I had to tell you this story I went to college with this girl and we uh, I roomed with her and she was we were both studying to be nurses and she was reading the canning season and she suddenly said I don't want to do this. I, the canning season, she said, there's an organic girl, who little girl grows up to be an organic farmer and describes what it's like uh, to put your hands in the earth and everything. And she said, this is what I want to do. This is, I want to live this girl's life. I want to, and she, the book takes place in Maine and she dropped out of college the next day and she moved to Maine and she became an organic farmer. And she said, I just wanted you to know that because it was so bizarre. And I was really moved by that. I couldn't, I mean, I figured her parents probably really hated me, but <laughs> I, I was, I, it had never, and I would never have known this if the woman hadn't come to the book signing that, that day, because, you know, half the time people don't, sometimes people write you letters, but a lot of times you don't hear these stories and they're really, you know, you flip back and you think, oh, okay, I'm really glad I did write that book. That was, that was important to somebody in some particular way. And so those are the kind of things that, you know, as much fun as the other stuff is, the, the razzle-dazzle. Um, I think when you hear stories like that, you kind of, you feel satisfied with what you, you know, you're glad you did what you did. You yeah. Know? And related to that, um, someone who's watching Josh, he really loved One Year in Cole Harbor, and he's wondering specifically what your inspiration was for that book. Oh, you know, I remember um, I had said I was never going to do, um, I, I'm so glad that he liked it, because I, I said to myself, I was never going to do a sequel to Everything on a Waffle. And then one day, the characters really just kind of reappeared in my head, and I don't, you know, it's funny because Everything on Waffle was not my favorite book. I always thought there was something of the ones I've written. I, I, I always thought there was something missing from that book. And it was the book that's definitely sold the most copies of any book I've done. But I wasn't all that pleased with it. So I'm surprised that I wrote the second one. Um, but you know what it was? A lot of that inspiration came from my father had this horrific upbringing, really. Um, he was an immigrant. And he lived in Chicago and immediately went into boarding schools because he immigrated with his, if this was like, you know, 1910. Um, and his mother was a single woman and, and so she, she couldn't work and take care of him. So she, he went to these horrible boarding schools and sort, sort of grew up in this, this horrible way, but he was the kindest man. He was just, I don't know how, and then he became, he was a spy. He, he was in the CIA and doing horrific things. And, um, but you would never know it. He, just, he was the nicest, gentlest, kindest person I've ever known. And it got me thinking about uh, kids, like the little boy, I can't even remember his name anymore. I never remember my books, but the little boy in one year in Cole Harbor. And um, so basically that little boy was my, in a sense, the essence of my father, somebody who's gentle and kind, um, and you, you think, how did they how did they come through this thing that they went through and maintain that? And and so I got to write a little bit about my father um, 
in a way, the essence, not the actual circumstances. And that, I guess that was the inspiration for that book. Great. We are almost at the end of our time together. I have what I call a lightning round, which... Oh, good. I love your lightning rounds, too. Yeah. <laughs> which I don't know what I think some weird attachment to game shows when I that's what I would have been doing on my pro D day probably watching uh, <laughs> watching the game show network um, all right so how the lightning round works is you don't need to give a lightning quick answer we have three or four minutes left um, but sort of like the first thing that comes to your mind um, this is not a psychological evaluation either. Um, so my first question is, have you ever formed an attachment to and named a wild animal? Yes. Um, my father was a biology high school teacher after he retired from the CIA. And uh, somebody gave him a squirrel that they found that was injured. And he brought it home and we were supposed to take care of it. And um, we did. And when it got to the point where it was no longer trying to run on its little broken leg. Um, we took it and we brought it out to the wild, uh, miles from our house. And we came home and it came right back to the house and its name was Pepper. And then it um, continued to do that uh, three or four times. And finally, we it didn't come back one day. But it, it was amazing because, I mean, we drove it and we left it miles from where we were and somehow it found its way back to us. And the other one would be we had a deer that was only had three legs that was limping through our yard constantly and I don't know what happened to the other leg but we named it Walter. <laughs> <laughs> you named the leg Walter or the deer Walter? No deer. We okay. the, deer Walter. the ghost leg Walter. Well this question was of course inspired by Billy the Bear in Pine Island Home. Um, when's the last time you had a waffle? Oh gosh um I, well, my daughter loves waffles, and when she comes home, I make them for breakfast occasionally, so probably a few months ago. Okay. I was thinking that I couldn't, I couldn't think of the answer for myself. Um, you know, the year after everything, I'm sorry, the year after everything on a waffle was published, I had waffles constantly, <laughs> because every school I went to made waffles for me. I've never had so many waffles in at the Newberry dinner. Um, my publisher made sure the chef made waffles for um, the dessert, which which put everybody's nose out of joint because they wanted foods based on. Their they food. wanted they wanted the seafood tower book. That's what they wanted. They wanted. Um, you, what's this? These just get lamer. Wow, I'm gonna go with it. What's your favorite thing to eat from a can? From a can? Oh gosh, oh, <laughs> hard one. Um, or a jar. Or a jar. Well, lately it's been pickled peas. Um, oh, okay, yep, yep. Um, I, I like I like canned corn. I have a thing about I'm a little obsessed with corn lately. But these things, of course, change. You know, I, I'm going to remember better answers when as soon as we get off, and you're going to be getting these emails from me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at sauerkraut. <laughs> um, and then last lightning round question: um, Which one of your characters would you most like in your bubble to be inside with? during the pandemic? Oh, well, I think it's Uncle Martin from um, The Core of the Barebone Plain, which was a book that quickly tanked, but it was actually <laughs> a very good book. But it had, Uncle Martin was the character baby most like me because he would just, uh, he didn't really want to be around people. Um, but he, and he didn't like, for instance, Christmas, but he liked the accoutrements. So he, he would order all these things over the internet to make Christmas, these huge Victorian Christmases, and then he wouldn't show up for it. Um, and that's sort of, I, I would like him because he would keep to his room and not bother me. <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, that whizzed by, but that brings us to the end. I want to thank you, Polly, so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I have two quick things uh, for everyone watching before we say goodbye. Um, we really want to hear your feedback on this event, and uh, your feedback also helps us plan for future virtual things here at the library. So you will find a link in the description, and I believe Lisa is also going to put the link to that very quick survey in the chat. If you've watched and you can click on that link and fill out the survey, you'll be entered to win a gift card to either Kids Books or Indigo in Park Royal. And those gift certificates are redeemable online. So uh, you can shop online if you are the winner. 
And we will also have another author event coming up next week on Thursday, October 29th at 4 p.m. I'm going to be chatting with Joel Sutherland, who is the author of the Haunted Canada series. He's an amazing storyteller and researcher, and I'm quite sensitive. So I think this will actually be a bit of a traumatizing event for me, and I'm looking forward to it. Polly, I want to say thank you again so much. It was really wonderful to spend time with you today. Oh, thank you, Shannon. As usual, it was just fantastic to talk to you. And thank you for all your wonderful questions and for hosting this. That was great. Fantastic. Thanks for joining, everyone. Bye for now.